so it's up to David and I uh, to give the last presentation before the, uh, the open discussion. Um, and what we wanted to do was uh, report on some things we've done in the project, really in terms of how we engage around the possible community that, that may well be digital musicology, whatever that means. Um, so I'm Kevin Page, I'm from the Oxford e Research Centre down the road, as is David Lewis, but David was also at Goldsmiths for a large part um, of the earlier stage of the project. Um, so uh, digital musicology. Um, what, what, I, what I'm going to go through quickly in the first half is, is who did transforming musicology uh, engage with and how did we engage with them and by what routes. And, and while I'm doing that, to think a little bit about what we mean by uh, the digital musicology community. Um, and really, I'm doing that because I'd like you to, to be thinking of questions. Really, this is, in some ways, a prompt for the discussion section that comes next, which is really sort of who or where did we not engage with? Are we heading in the right direction? Um, and where next? Uh, so as we're going through, sort of keep questions in mind. Uh, this is as much to provoke questions about where we want to go next um, and hopefully where you want to go next um, as it is to say the things that we've done. So I, I, I thought a, a reasonable start would be to look at the proposal and say who we'd engage with. Um, and the proposal is set up, actually, interestingly, to bring together different communities and take a, a multidisciplinary approach, really, from the off. Uh, so I've got a little figure that will just say the, the, the groups that are mentioned in the proposal. Uh, so there's musicologists. This is uh, the obvious one. Um, there's also music technologists. Uh, so that was in the proposal, and, and really I think at the core of Transform Musicology was this idea of taking those technologies that had come out of music information retrieval and other elements of, of music knowledge um, technologies around that and apply them to the field of musicology and thus uh, affect in some sense a transformation or at least a, a supplement. Um, the, the proposal also talks about digital librarians. I think that's one thing that we mustn't forget is, is in terms of the source material. Where are the digital sources that we use the music technologies uh, to conduct musicology investigations with? And the, the, the proposal also brings up the idea of sort of the interested public, that this goes beyond those, as Tim said um, at the beginning of today, uh, goes beyond people who, who consider themselves a musicologist formally. So as I'm going through the different activities we've done, um, one thing to think about is sort of where on this chart those activities sit. Who did they interact with? Uh, did we do any good at, at, at interacting with different people uh, from across this spread? And, and did we do anything in the middle? You know, and, and where, if there is a transformation, is it occurring? So I'll go for the obvious things first, which is in terms of academic output. I, I looked through the conferences that we published to, and if you go to the project website, there's a really long list, actually, of publications to a much wider and more comprehensive spread of conferences that are here. But I think these are really sort of the, uh, the, the, the highlight conferences, the ones I think that had sort of the, the meatiest papers, shall we say. Um, so the first one, actually, we did get to IMS. We got to the International Musicological Society. Um, that was a great experience, actually. That was very positive. Um, I note that the digital part often seems to get put in a relatively small room. Um, but that does mean that it was standing room only. Um, it genuinely was, in that session, people standing at the back, which I thought was great. I mean, there was a lot of interest um, in the work that was being presented in that session, including our own. Um, and there was the year before uh, the YAML and IMS joint conference, uh, which was Music Research in the Digital Age, which I think, again, is a, a really interesting thing to note about where that community is going and where it's engaging uh, with these technologies. There's the Digital Humanities Conference, which we also attended. Um, again, music actually isn't, in, in my mind, that strong there. It's not that well represented. There's an awful lot of text um, and image. Um, uh, but I think there was a fairly strong showing this year. We had some papers there. Um, and it was spread across a number of sessions. Um, and I think what's very interesting about DH is it's a, a field that always struggles to define itself, really, as a group of people working with the digital in the humanities. Um, but I do see some parallels with sort of musicology also being very broad in the different approaches it takes, whether that being sort of historical musicology or, or, or people you know, working with the audio or performance. There's a great range. And actually, the way that the different digital technologies interact with those different types of research within this sort of brand, I think, is an interesting comparison and, and maybe a, 
a sort of warning to when we say, what do we mean by digital musicology? Is it a similar parallel to what do we mean by digital humanities? Izmir, so, so as Tim mentioned right at the beginning, um, a lot of the technology that we're applying here comes from the music information retrieval world and the main conference there um, is Izmir. And they, we actually ended up putting quite a few papers there. And it's interesting to say, okay, that's not a, a musicology conference. So uh, why are we pushing there? Are we affecting a difference there? Even though that conference itself uh, was founded very much with the idea of uh, exploring music, what it tends to have quite a bias towards these days are the Spotify's of this world, are the Amazon Musics, um, are the, uh, you know, the, the commercial companies where you're trying to, you know, use Shazam to find a piece of music. Um, but we did run a tutorial um, that was organised by Richard, um, addressing the MIR needs of musicologists to try and alert that community to why we think that actually applying these technologies to musicology rather than um, industrial applications um, is actually harder and more interesting. And you know, every, every researcher loves a harder problem. Um, so I think that was a very positive engagement that we had there. Um, and in terms of the digital libraries, uh, we've a few times pushed to the joint conference on digital libraries, which is the main digital libraries conference. Um, and also, as we go down, getting techier and techier each time, um, we also went to the European Semantic Web Conference. What was interesting about that last year was there was the first workshop on humanities in the semantic web, which I think does support that idea, actually, that the technologists there are looking at the types of information and the types of studies that are occurring in the humanities and going, actually, this, this is interesting, and there are challenges here beyond that that have already been addressed in the sciences. So I think that's um, a very positive thing. One of the other things we did um, really sort of on that juncture is actually start a new workshop. So to, to try and essentially found a bit of a, a, a new community, which really was, I think, certainly for me, I started this with, with Ben Fields uh, four years ago. Ben Fields was one of the researchers on the project um, at the time um, of noting that, you know, conferences like Izmir started very much bringing together musicologists technologists from the information retrieval world and digital libraries, but had perhaps wandered somewhat away from that. And could we therefore focus on a, a particular part of that research landscape um, that, that didn't seem to be getting as much love as perhaps it deserved, to give it a place um, where we could discuss how the source material, the digital libraries, uh, could be used for digital musicology and how we might use tools um, to investigate that, what digital tools we might use. And we were obviously a little nervous, you know, that we, we sort of did the sounding out, will anyone want to come? Um, and the first one we did, uh, we co-located in London with JCDL, with the Digital Libraries Conference. Um, and we did do that somewhat deliberately, uh, mostly because we, we felt we knew the community around London. We thought we'd have a reasonable chance of a, of a half decent turnout. And, and very pleasingly, we did. We had uh, over 20 papers, and we had over 40 attendees in the first year, which, frankly, we were really, really surprised by. We thought it would be more like sort of 10, 12, 15. And I think that's a really healthy sign about, about the community that is interested in this work. We also uh, ran a thing called a Transform Musicology Challenge. Um, I think one of the challenges is that from the technology side, from sort of the computer science side, um, the way that workshops work, the way that there's value in the publication. So we tried quite hard to make sure that the papers published here would be full papers in the computer science style, so they'd be you know, four to eight pages, double column, ACM format, and that they would go into the ACM digital library, which gives them some value and some credence to those um, who are publishing them. But obviously, this can close off the interaction we want, which is to also be able to have some more speculative investigations, perhaps coming from the musicology side, where there isn't necessarily completed work to report. So we very explicitly added into this um, the idea of, of, of a challenge session and panels where we could invite people to give you know, earlier work, um, uh, early and late breaking uh, work to discuss, to try and promote the discussion of where we might go next. The second one, we co-located with JCDL again. It went very well the first year. This time it was in Knoxville, Tennessee. How many people know Knoxville, Tennessee? Yeah, so um, seven papers and 15 attendees, um, and, and, and you know, perhaps a, a little bit of reflection there, how it works. Although, again, what was really positive is, is we actually had, of, of those 15 attendees, I think five came from the nearby universities um, and from their music departments. They were musicologists who'd come. 
So, so although the papers were technical, we very much did pull in, in that relatively small audience, um, those um, who were working on using these and applying these technologies. And I think even there, there is something positive. So we took a slightly different track in 2016, and um, we co-located with Izmet, uh, which was in New York in the summer. Uh, but in doing so, we were a little nervous. We didn't want to get sucked into just the, the entire ISMIT community, so we were very careful in uh, hosting it somewhere a little distinct. And actually, the music library at the NYU uh, library were very gracious in hosting us, which, again, I think gave it a bit of a flavor that meant that we had many attendees who came to the workshop um, who weren't at Izmir and primarily were from, actually, uh, the music schools um, around New York. And I thought that, again, was very positive. We had over 50 attendees, 50, over 15 uh, papers and posters. And then this year, actually, just over a little month ago, um, we tried to pull the same trick. We co-hosted with Izmir, which is in Suzhou in China. Um, and again, we this time hosted at the Shanghai Conservatory of Music and got a lot of interest there, actually. That was very positively supported by them um, and had even more attendees. I thought it was 50, but I actually counted the number of the people in the photo that's coming up in a moment. And um, there were 57 in that, and I know there are some people who aren't in it. So it was over 60 and 16 papers. But that was really interesting because I think there, there's actually a lot of digital material that isn't well studied, actually, that comes out of uh, the Chinese digital libraries. And in terms of interpreting, there were, there were several papers on Chinese opera, for instance, and applying uh, computational methods to the analysis of them, um, which I think, again, was a, a very positive sign to how this particular little um, community was building. And there's, there's everyone happily outside the Shanghai Conservatory on a, on a sunny Saturday afternoon. We also um, did some public engagement. Um, I, hopefully, you will have seen several of these in the posters outside. So there was this Hearing It Wagner um, event three years ago, something like that, uh, which was held up at the Birmingham Hippodrome, which was capturing from these shimmer devices people's responses um, to the entire ring cycle, and also Carolyn uh, very kindly capturing digital annotations to align them. Um, this numbers into notes activity, which Dave DeRaw, who's with us um, and had a poster in the session, worked with Emily Howard, who won a British composer orchestral on... Yeah, which is wonderful, on Wednesday. Um, and this was looking, again, in the public engagement about how you can go from numerical representations into music. And uh, way back, we ran a Lynx Music Hackathon, uh, where we basically took all the data that we've been working with and basically said, come along and play with it with us. So open to the general public, but much more on the technical end. Um, and again, with all of these, think about where that sits in terms of what communities it is or isn't interacting with. I think one of the, 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 the most important things, actually, that we've done um, as an engagement activity is the Digital Musicology Summer School, which is part of the Digital Humanities Summer School uh, that runs here every year in the summer in July. We've now run three iterations of this course. Um, it's around 20 students each, each year. I'm pleased that I've seen some here today. Um, it's around 22 and a half hours of contact time. We tend to advertise to music departments and sort of international digital uh, humanities and musicology mailing lists. Um, and I'll take you through some of the details of what we've tried to do there because it's actually really hard. So, so one of the sessions I give in this is to talk about linked data in musicology. But before I started running the digital musicology course, I spent the entire week teaching people about linked data. And, and again, this is something I think about the spread of techniques that can be applied is it is really quite hard to both give people uh, examples they can work on where they can see real results and give them experience of learning the different tools and techniques that are available in only, inverted commas, 22 and a half hours of contact time, which isn't that long. So I'll spend a little time just telling you how we structured the week, um, because it, it might give you an idea about the sort of ways you can bring this together. So we sort of did some scene setting where we had speakers coming in and giving some examples of projects that had run and generally what we meant by music information retrieval um, and digital musicology. We then spent some time on tools around recordings and audio. So this was using essentially feature extraction for audio and then uh, machine learning um, uh, for, for classifiers uh, on those audio features and analyzing big audio resources. So that became one block of time. And you can see, even at this point, we've already blown through Monday and Tuesday of our available time. Uh, data about data, so that's about how you glue all this together using linked data. Uh, we did some time on symbolic notation. So we were using um, 
uh, MEI, uh, using things like uh, Vorobio, uh, using Music 21 to process it, so very much on the symbolic side. Um, some case studies of work that was successfully completed, and then an end-to-end -end example which tried to tie that all together. And at that point, you're done, actually, in, in, in a week, even on that number of hours. That's about all you, might, you can fit in. And I'll, I'll come back to that very briefly in a moment. I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, we have some follow-on collaborations, and this, again, I think is an interesting way in which we're pushing forward the lessons that we've learned in Transforming Musicology into other partnerships, uh, some industrial. So uh, Tim has uh, a follow-on project called Learn to Play, working uh, with Tito Music, which you saw earlier, and Brad Cohen, who was also here um, earlier. Um, we had the great pleasure, actually, of working uh, with Daniel Grimley, who's also with us, um, uh, which came together, actually, during Transform Musicology and has now moved on to uh, a follow-on project uh, with Delius, about Delius. And I think what's really interesting there is there's a very strong musicological uh, case um, and piece of work being done, and we're providing some of the technology that was developed in Transform Musicology to create an exhibition of articles around that work with the British Library, which, again, starts pushing it out uh, potentially to other users. And we have uh, just received uh, word that uh, we have another project uh, following on called Unlocking Musicology, which will again apply some of the methods and tools to a number of different venues, to uh, Rillum in New York, to the New York Philharmonic Data, and to the Internet Archive, Live Music Archive. Those won't be really inventing any new pieces of research from our point of view, from the technology point of view, but applying things that we've learnt um, in Transform Musicology to these different places. And I think overall that means we've done quite a lot. But when I go back and look at this diagram, I go, well, you know, where is the digital transformation? What have we transformed? Have we transformed musicology? Have we actually spent some time maybe trying to transform music information retrieval rather than transform musicology? Are we trying to make them more musicologically minded? Have we transformed digital libraries? And I think we've certainly, certainly engendered some, some sort of multidisciplinary flows. We've certainly pulled people and their activities between these areas from one to the other, and we've crossed in the middle. But I think actually it's, it's arguable that the, the only transformational part we've had is through the summer school. That's where we've been working directly with, with musicologists, many of them at early stages in their career. Um, and at that point, I'm going to hand over to David, because really I, I leave you the question there is, what do we do about teaching and curriculums for this kind of material? Now we try to do switch between computers and things happen. Yes. It, if I get a black screen, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Um, so, uh, yes, it is. I want the black screen. <laughs> yeah. This is while I, the state of my brain at the moment. But yes, so um, as Kevin said, a lot of the activities that we've done have come under um, dissemination research, but also quite a lot of what we want to do is gather together and network a community. Because um, one of the things that we do notice is there's lots of people. The people who are working in this sort of digital musicology world are quite dispersed. They can be in music departments, they can be in computing departments, they can be in IT departments, they can be members of the public, as Tim said earlier, they can be in archives or libraries. They don't necessarily have the same um, sharing environments. They may go to different conferences. There's no obvious journal for, 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 for these sort of things to come together. Um, and so activities like the LFM are partly there to, um, to, to provide some more possible fora for these intersections to, uh, to communicate. Um, but the other thing that you can do to try to improve that dispersion is recruitment, I think, is getting more people into doing this sort of thing. Um, and there the summer school is important. Um, but I do worry a little bit that... Um, we're getting people who are possibly already on the path, who are already digital doing digital musicology in some areas and want to expand their knowledge or their skills. Um, people who, like me, came to this sort of field because we could already program. Um, I, I worry that to some extent we're losing diversity by leaving it so late. And the question is, can we grab people early enough 
that they can discover they're interested in this before they've written it off. Can we get into university music departments, I think is, the, is an obvious place to start. And so what I've done um, is I've tried to put some ideas of things you could do and some questions onto some slides. And I am not going to come up with this is what I think a curriculum should be or how it should work, but just as discussion points. So the first thing I think that one thinks of is um, make a digital musicology course. Third year, masters, something like that. Take as a model, perhaps, so a lot of the digital humanities courses, but also the summer school. As uh, Kevin said, we've got 22 odd hours um, of material, of very compressed material. It could easily be either expanded to a full year course or perhaps comp compressed a little to make a, a single semester course. Um, so the first question is, what do you gain by taking it from um, a summer school that has wide recruitment uh, to something in a university? Is there something, is, the, is there benefit to putting it into a music department? But another question is, is this already too late? If digital musicology has important skills, if, if these are things we want people to kick around, doing it just as they finish may be a problem. Um, and so perhaps we could push it a bit earlier. What happens if we make it a first year course? Like other key skills that you learn, like analysis, um, like techniques of composition. Um, but what are, what, what's this going to look like? What are the foundations? If, if we can't really nail down what's vital, well, we could imagine teaching programming, data analysis, that sort of thing. But how do we stop that from being such an abstract, uninteresting, unuseful um, course for a musicologist? So there's challenges with that approach. What's more attractive in some ways is the idea perhaps of making digital musicology an explicit learning outcome in other courses. So what you do is you have, for every course, you review it and say, what aspects of this could have maybe one lecture of the thing as with, with some discussion of digital musicology, a uh, course work, um, what do you call it? A sub, one of the, some of the coursework could have digital components. Um, so how would you integrate it in? You could imagine um, quite a lot of uh, courses where this is possible. I think one of the really encouraging things of, of the discussions we've had earlier is the extent to which there's benefit from even relatively rudimentary integration of digital tooling and digital resources um, into our investigations, being able to explore connections between um, music. If you had authoring tools for the sorts of things that Roy was talking about, then a student who submits an essay that shows musical connections that's actually a digital essay would be an incredibly valuable thing. Even something like stylistic composition, techniques of composition, you can imagine the benefits to a student to be able to command a tool that would tell them whenever, you know, for if, if they're encountering, say, the top line, the, the, the melody of this chorale I'm trying to harmonise has this particular pattern, I've written myself a bass line that does this, give me every example of what Bach does, and then I will understand better what, what, what I might do, may help much better than a student trying to learn it sort of by memorising all of Riemann Schneider. Um, so uh, that you can imagine but how do you support the students doing this? We can't necessarily rely on every single course having someone, so there'd need to be some sort of external support. And really, is this just going to overload the existing courses and overload the curriculum? Um, the other idea I came up with is that you just have a lab. Um, students can turn up. They can learn some skills that they think are relevant. They can ask questions. They can work on projects. And they're allowed to submit digital components in coursework when, when it's agreed by the, the convener of that particular course. But there's no necessary plain curriculum, and it's supported just by, say, seminars, talks, and a member of staff who knows what's going on always being there. Um, but if it wasn't compulsory, if it wasn't part of the curriculum, would a student use it? Um, those are my points of question. I've lost the question. 
Those are the sorts of things that I thought I would sort of just drop down there 